Second group is going to start now. Right. A very good evening to everyone. Today in my group, which consists of Karen, Sunil, Jaying, and I, will be presenting on a topic on miscommunication. And our reference topic for today will be on Tenerife Airport disaster. Now, before proceeding on to the content page, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever sat in a plane before? I bet all of you does, correct? Sure. Now, have you ever think of your life being lost in a split second? <laughs> Due to pilot error, or ADC error, air traffic controller error, or even mechanical failure? Okay, with that, I will move on to the content. First of all, the content page uh, comprises of six main points. Introduction, facts and history will be covered by myself. Factors leading to the disaster will be covered by Jai Ying. Industry response will be covered by Sunil. Lessons learned and conclusion will be covered by Karen. Now, let's take a short, uh, take a short video clip of two minutes on what exactly happened between two aircraft and the air traffic controller. Sorry for the temptation. Muted, muted, it's muted. Without permission. We have 700 meters visibility here now. Wait a minute. We don't have ATC clearance. I know that. Go ahead, ask. Uh, KLM 4805 uh, is now ready for takeoff. Um, we're waiting for ATC clearance. KLM 4805, you're clear to the Papa Beacon. The KLM is given its ATC clearance, which is simply the route it must follow after takeoff. Now it must wait for permission to take off. Roger, sir, we're clear to the Papa Beacon, uh, flight level 90. Uh, right turn out 040 until intercepting the 325. Um, we're now we're going. But why didn't his crew stop him? It's very difficult for a co pilot or a flight engineer to tell the captain, hey, look, you missed something. Tenerife exposed a problem that had long existed in commercial air travel. The pilot was regarded, and often regarded himself, as God. The captain is always right, he's never wrong. No junior officer was ever going to contradict the airline's top pilot, the man who'd given him his license. Adam, I'm going to send 360, report runway clear. Did you hear that? What are you saying? Is it clear that Oh, yes. Captain Van Zanten, highly stressed, knowing that he has to take off or abandon the flight. His crew, aware that he's done wrong, but frightened to tell him. Disaster is now inevitable. Now, as you can see from my video, the impact is very big. Okay, now following on to the facts of this Tenerife Airport disaster. It happens on Sunday, March 27, 1977, due to a multitude of factors which will be explained by my uh, members later. Uh, from 1977 until now, it's about 40 years. However, it's still considered one of the worst aviation history in aircraft industry. So, uh, the two aircraft involved are namely the 747 aircraft, and they are the KLM Flight 4805 and the Pan Am Flight 1736. And like, like, I said, uh, like what I said earlier on, it's the worst disaster in aviation history. Casualties. 248 aboard the KLM aircraft and 335 out of 336 aboard the Pan Am, Pacific, uh, Pan Am aircraft. Now, background. A bomb exploded at this Grand Canaria airport. If you wonder where Grand Canaria is, it's actually an uh, island in Spain. So, uh, a bomb exploded there, therefore the airport was closed due to an imminent threat of a second bomb. Uh, and the aircrafts were all being diverted to Tenerife Airport, which is not used to handling so much aircraft. It's a, just a very small airport. <coughs> and the Tenerife Airport is 2,077 feet above sea level. Take a note at 2,077 feet. 
Now, due to the size constraint of the airport, the aircrafts were being forced to park on the taxiway. Now, normally in airport, the taxiway is not used for parking. It's used for the aircraft to taxi the aircraft to the runway itself. However, it, on this particular day, all the aircrafts were being forced to park on the taxiway. <coughs> now, on that day, only two ATCs were on shift. Normally, on a busy airport, how many ATCs will you expect? Definitely more than two. So, on this particular day, only two ADCs were on shift and they were forced, I mean, they were tasked to handle a large number of aircraft, which means their workload increased. And the weather was turning very bad with fog gathering due to high density clouds. If you remember what I said earlier on what to take note, the 2,007 feet above sea level. And this explained for the sudden change in weather in the Tenerife airport. Third point. There was no radar in the airport itself. Therefore, the air traffic controllers can only see the aircraft visually. And their only form of communication is through radio. For this diagram, I will leave it to Jia Ying to take you over. Now, uh, Jia Ying, please. Thank you, Yixiang. Now I will be explaining the leading factors that lead to this disaster. First, the airport being forced to accommodate this large number of the aircrafts and uh, this is way beyond its capacity. And then the KPL plan was actually cleared by the control tower and uh, is asked to back taxi at the end of the single runway and make a 180 turn. And next, the 10 a.m. aircraft was asked to park at the same taxi runway and uh, exist at exist three. However, remember at that point is very um, the weather is foggy, so that uh, the crew is holding a map and reading where is the exit three, and he couldn't find the exit three correctly. So therefore, it's reflected as the collision between the KLM and also the Pan Am flight. Uh, is the actually happens near the exit four instead of exit three, and then the miscommunication between the co-pilots and controller. On the day itself, the co-pilots was saying that uh, we are now take off, and this means to the uh, co-pilots is that they are begin to take off. However, to the control tower. They are meaning that uh, they are in takeoff position and ready to be final, final clearance. And at this point, that uh, is also very um, sad and fortunate is that the Pan Am flight is actually have this simultaneous radio call to the control tower and telling them that they are still on the taxi runway. This caused a radio interference so that there is a true crucial message that is not heard by the KLM captain. One is that uh, um, the control tower actually says, stand by for takeoff, I will call you. This actually explains that the control tower actually refers you should be at the takeoff position instead of begin to take off. And another thing is that the 10 a.m. aircraft position was lost. This is due to the heavy frog and um, the, the two airplanes couldn't see each other and also the control tower can't see the airplanes because the frog limited the visibility that below 1,000 feet. And um, for this disaster actually cost 583 lives and uh, for this is definitely a very uh, big tragedy so I will with this I will pass on to my roommate to explain further on the industry response. Okay, uh, thank you Jane. Uh, hello, good afternoon. I'm Sunil and I shall go through with you uh, the kind of industry response that was seen throughout the world uh, following the disaster. Now basically, uh, various uh, aviation organizations throughout the world 
uh, after this particular disaster, went through with a series of systemic changes to ensure that human error was reduced. So basically, uh, all the sort of uh, steps that were taken up by the aviation uh, uh, organizations can be uh, broadly classified under the umbrella term called pre crew resource management. Now, this particular uh, framework was uh, is uh, basically uh, implemented in environments where the hu human errors can cause a devastating impact. So, uh, it's the framework is pretty broad. However, we should we should uh, be narrowing down to just a few aspects of it, namely communication, assertiveness, and leadership. Now, we should go through some of the guidelines that uh, are detailed in the CRM uh, procedures. Uh, with regards to communication. You can see that it states that communication should be concise, clear, and done in a timely fashion. Now, uh, if we uh, think about what happened during the disaster, uh, the information regarding the position of the Pan Am aircraft was not known to the KLM pilot. If this information was transmitted from the ATC to the KLM pilot, this disaster might have been, ha have been averted. Next, we go over to the use of standard terminology, which was heavily emphasized in a lot of uh, the reports that came up after the disaster itself. Uh, one of the ambiguous phrases used in uh, the lead up to the uh, disaster itself was, we are ready for takeoff. Now, this is something that was misunderstood by the ATC uh, in uh, a different way. Uh, so basically, this confusion itself could have been avoided if uh, a more standard industry term was used or was in place at that time. Uh, also, we noticed that uh, there was there wasn't enough effort on part of all parties uh, of communication to ensure that uh, all of them uh, received the image. Uh, sorry, the, the 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 information correctly. They should have clarified and they should have repeated and reiterated whatever they said. And if that had been followed, there's a chance that the disaster again might have been averted. Another extremely important uh, pointer uh, is that. Any sort of information should be done constructively so as to not create conflict within the team. Uh, we shall go over to the next important to topic, which is assertion. Oftentimes, uh, crew members are unwilling uh, to you know, uh, put across their points of view to the leader, which in this case uh, is the pilot. This is because they assume that the leader knows what he's doing or they're afraid to offend him. So the crew resource management framework uh, harps on these two factors of inquiry and advocacy uh, so that uh, all the uh, team members put across their views without fear uh, uh, so that uh, all the uh, sort of factors that affect that are playing around in the situation are communicated clearly to the captain. Finally, we come over to how leadership itself can affect uh, the, the communication flow. The leader in this case is the, the KLM captain and he should have taken it upon himself to make sure that communication is regulated and that he motivates his crew members. Uh, we can see, uh, we could see from the video that uh, the co-pilot did try to uh, communicate to uh, the pilot regarding the fact that uh, the Pan Am aircraft was not clear. However, the pilot himself was not willing to listen to him and uh, he went ahead with his own decision making. So uh, basically these two points uh, make us realize that it's important for the team to work together and that the leader himself should not make all the decisions. So basically, the team feels that if uh, these measures were in place uh, at that time, the chance of the disaster being averted are pretty high. So I'll just pass on the presentation to Karan now. Uh, thank you, Sunil. Uh, today I'll be talking on uh, lessons learned and basically how you can apply these lessons suppose you go to a workplace. A three main lessons learned, standardization is absolutely essential, teamwork is necessary, and with regard to safety, even the tiniest bit of input can make a huge difference. Uh, moving on, uh, standardization. At the workplace, avoid generic terms like suppose take off in this case, and okay. Okay is a very generic term which can be implied as a question, as an assertion, so please try to avoid generic terms like this. Now, regard to permissions and requests, Permissions and requests have to be standard. That should be a standard procedure, which uh, which enables you to make them. Just going and asking someone, "Can I do this?" or "Is this the way to do this this task?" is not the way to go. Permissions and almost every company will have a normal a form or a way of a standard procedure where you can ask for permission, ask for request. Now, with regard to this, there should be no leniency. 
you should strict uh, you should strictly adhere to the principles because any any uh, um, uh, any mistake in this or non uh, leniency would result in miscommunication. Now moving on to teamwork. Okay, as we saw from the video, we saw that the second in command, namely the flight engineer, he tried to voice out his opinions, but it was not uh, taken into account by the captain. Now this was because of hierarchical culture. But I feel that you should voice your opinions. Voicing your opinions does not necessarily mean voicing an opinion which is diff different or contradicts the opinion of, of the person who gave you the opinion. So voicing your opinions just means that whatever someone, suppose someone tells you to do something, you voice your opinions on how you're going to do it. And just another tip, safety is everyone's responsibility. You would love this at work. Moving on, small measures go a long way. Suppose someone gives you a, a memorandum of instruction and tells you, you know, this is the task you're supposed to do. Pay attention to detail. Do not, do not leave out a single, uh, single piece of information as, as this will definitely result in miscommunication. Never take anything for granted because suppose someone tells you your, your, this part of the work is done and you're supposed to continue from this other part. Now, what if you take into account that the other part was not done properly, it will be blamed on you. So never take anything for granted, never leave any stone unturned to make sure that your work is perfect. Be absolutely clear and certain. What this means is if someone gives you a task, you say, yes, I'm going to achieve this task and you also tell them in what method you're going to achieve this task. This makes sure that the person and you are on the same wavelength and there's no miscommunication. Okay, basically conclusion, miscommunication happens because there's a myriad of cultures nowadays in, in today's workforce and miscommunication will always happen. It can, uh, can be avoided if you take active steps to do so. If miscommunication happens, it's conflict management, which is another topic. And the scale of errors can be devastating. As you've seen here, it costs 583 lives. But from a supply chain standpoint, it may cost you millions of dollars just because one person misinterpreted what another person said. Now, before, before I round up this entire presentation, I'll give, you a, I'll give you a few tips on how to avoid miscommunication in the workplace. Suppose you're speaking to more than one person, like how I'm doing here, make sure you have everyone's attention. Now that you have everyone's attention, everyone is focused on you and not on their own work. So this will likely help to reduce miscommunication occurring. Always end with a reaffirming question. Suppose I, I give you a statement or tell you something to do, end with questions like, do you feel the same way? Do you have any suggestions? Avoid questions like, uh, what do you think? Because these can be misinterpreted. Give your partner time to think and respond. Always give a person time because not everyone is spontaneous. Understand body language. Non-verbal communication is essential as each person is different. And finally, give reminders. In case you delegated a task to someone and there's a, de there's a deadline of one month, check up in between intervals to know that both of you are on the same wavelength. Now, that's it. Thank you so much for listening. Do you guys have any questions? No okay, let me ask, let me put this forward. Uh, basically, all of you have worked in numerous group projects, right? I mean, EID and all your design projects. And you come across people from like different places, like uh, me from India, people from China, people from Indonesia. And obviously, some miscommunication would have happened. Like, could any of you just give an example of how you faced it? How did you deal with it before Profcom? How is Profcom helping you with that? Is anyone care to explain? Not at all. <laughs> At least can I have a show of hands of how many of you have encountered miscommunication in group projects? None. Oh, well, it's very, very effective communication in our group then. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I think even if we have miscommunication, some of us won't admit it, or we're just not aware that it's communicated. It just falls on the bridge. Okay. So you just let it go, basically. Yes. Okay. Oh. The <laughs> That's what we Anything else? Do you have any questions? <laughs> um, you're in the reference, right? Yes, yes ma'am.